From the earliest times the devil has made his mark, historically and geographically, in Ireland, the nomenclature of many places indicates that they are his exclusive property. But here we must deal with a later period of his activity. A quaint tale comes to us from County Tipperary of a man bargaining for the price of his soul, in which as usual the devil is worsted by a simple trick, and gets nothing for his trouble. Near Shronal in that county are still to be seen the ruins of Damaville Court, formerly the residence of the Damer family, and from which locality they took the title of Baron Milton of Shronal. The first of the family to settle in Ireland, Joseph Damer, had been formerly in the service of the Parliament, but not deeming it safe to remain in, in England after the Restoration, came over to this country and, taking advantage of the cheapness of land at that time, purchased large estates. It was evidently of this member of the family that the following tale is told. He possessed great wealth, and was darkly hinted that this had come to him from no lawful source, that in fact he had made a bargain with the devil to sell his soul to him for a top boot full of gold. His satanic majesty greedily accepted the offer, and on the day appointed for the ratification of the bargain arrived with a sufficiency of bullion from the bank of sticks. He was ushered into a room, in the middle of which stood the empty top boot, into this he poured the gold, but to his surprise it remained as empty as before. He hastened away for more gold, with the same result. Repeated journeys to and fro for fresh supplies still left the boot as empty as when he began, until at length in sheer disgust he took his final departure, leaving Damer in possession of the gold, and as well, for a few brief years, at all events, of that spiritual commodity he had valued at so little. In process of time the secret leaked out. The wily Damer had taken the sole off the boot, and had then securely fastened the latter over a hole in the floor. In the story underneath was a series of large, empty cellars, in which he had stationed men armed with shovels, who were under instructions to remove each succeeding shower of gold, and so make room for more. Another story comes from Ballinagard in County Limerick, the residence of the Crocker family, though it is probably later in point of time, in it the devil appears in a different role. Once upon a time Mr. Crocker of Ballinagard was out hunting, but as the country was very difficult few were able to keep up with the hounds. The chase lasted all day, and late in the evening Crocker and a handsome dark stranger, mounted on a magnificent black horse, were alone at the death. Crocker, delighted at his companion's prowess, asked him home, and the usual festivities were kept up fast and furious till far into the night. The stranger was shown to a bedroom, and as the servant was pulling off his boots he saw that he had a cloven hoof. In the morning he acquainted his master with the fact, and both went to see the stranger. The latter had disappeared, and so had his horse, but the bedroom carpet was seared by a red-hot hoof, while four hoof marks were imprinted on the floor of the horse's stall. What incident gave rise to the story we cannot tell, but there was a saying among the peasantry that such and such a thing occurred as sure as the devil was in Ballinagard. A most remarkable instance of legal proceedings being instituted at the instigation of a ghost comes from the county down in the year 1662. About Michaelmas one Francis Taverner, servant to Lord Chichester, was riding home on horseback late one night from Hilborough, and on nearing Doctonbridge his horse suddenly stood still, and he, not suspecting anything out of the common, but merely supposing him to have the staggers, got down to bleed him in the mouth, and then remounted. As he was proceeding two horsemen seemed to pass him, though he heard no sound of horses' hoofs. Presently there appeared a third at his elbow, apparently clad in a long white coat, having the appearance of one James Haddock, an inhabitant of Malone who had died about five years previously. When the startled taverner asked him in God's name who he was, he told him that he was James Haddock, and recalled himself to his mind by relating a trifling incident that had occurred in Taverner's father's house a short while before Haddock's death. Taverner asked him why he spoke with him, he told him, because he was a man of more resolution than other men, and requested him to ride along with him in order that he might acquaint him with the business he desired him to perform. Taverner refused, and, as they were at a crossroad, went his own way. 
Immediately after parting with the spectre there arose a mighty wind, and with all he heard very hideous screeches and noises, to his great amazement. At last he heard the cocks crow, to his great comfort, he alighted off his horse, and falling to prayer desired God's assistance, and so got safe home. The following night the ghost appeared again to him, as he sat by the fire, and thereupon declared to him the reason for its appearance, and the errand upon which it wished to send him. It bade him go to Eleanor Walsh, its widow, who was now married to one Davis, and say to her that it was the will of her late husband that their son David should be righted in the matter of a lease which the father had bequeathed to him, but of which the stepfather had unjustly deprived him. Taverner refused to do so, partly because he did not desire to gain the ill will of his neighbors, and partly because he feared being taken for one demented, but the ghost so thoroughly frightened him by appearing to him every night for a month, that in the end he promised, to fulfill its wishes. He went to Malone, found a woman named Eleanor Walsh, who proved to be the wrong person, but who told him she had a namesake living hard by, upon which Taverner took no further trouble in the matter, and returned without delivering his message. The same night he was awakened by something pressing upon him, and saw again the ghost of Haddock in a white coat, which asked him if he had delivered the message, to which Taverner mendaciously replied that he had been to Malone and had seen Eleanor Walsh. Upon which the ghost looked with a more friendly air upon him, bidding him not to be afraid, and then vanished in a flash of brightness. But having learnt the truth of the matter in some mysterious way, it again appeared, this time in a great fury, and threatened to tear him to pieces if he did not do as it desired. Utterly unnerved by these unearthly visits, Taverner left his house in the mountains and went into the town of Belfast, where he sat up all night in the house of a shoemaker named Purse, where were also two or three of Lord Chichester's servants. About midnight, as they were all by the fireside, they beheld Taverner's countenance change and a trembling to fall upon him, who presently espied the apparition in a room opposite him, and took up the candle and went to it, and resolutely asked it in the name of God wherefore it haunted him. It replied, because he had not delivered the message, and withal repeated the threat of tearing him in pieces if he did not do so speedily, and so, changing itself into many prodigious shapes, it vanished in white like a ghost. In a very dejected frame of mind Taverner related the incident to some of Lord Chichester's family, and the chaplain, Mr. James South, advised him to go and deliver the message to the widow, which he accordingly did, and thereupon experienced great quietness of mind. The following day Taverner was summoned before the court of the celebrated Jeremy Taylor, Bishop of Down, who carefully examined him about the matter, and advised him the next time the spirit appeared to ask it the following questions, whence are you? Are you a good or a bad spirit? Where is your abode? What station do you hold? How are you regimented in the other world? What is the reason that you appear for the relief of your son in so small a matter, when so many widows and orphans are oppressed, and none from thence of their relations appear as you do to write them? That night Taverner went to Lord Conway's house. Feeling the coming presence of the apparition, and being unwilling to create any disturbance within doors, he and his brother went out into the courtyard, where they saw the spirit coming over the wall. He told it what he had done, and it promised not to trouble him any more, but threatened the executors if they did not see the boy righted. Here his brother put him in mind to ask the spirit what the bishop bid him, which he did presently. But it gave him no answer, but crawled on its hands and feet over the wall again, and so vanished in white with a most melodious harmony. The boy's friends then brought an action, apparently in the bishop's court, against the executors and trustees, one of the latter, John Costlet, who was also the boy's uncle, tried the effect of bluff, but the threat of what the apparition could and might do to him scared him into a promise of justice. Whatever explanation we may choose to give of the supernatural element in the previous, there seems to be no doubt that such an incident occurred, and that the story is, in the main, true to fact, as it was taken by Glanville from a letter of Mr. Thomas Alcox, the secretary to Bishop Taylor's court, who must therefore have heard the entire story from Taverner's own lips. The incident is vividly remembered in local tradition, from which many picturesque details are added, especially with reference to the trial, 
the subsequent writing of young David Haddock, and the ultimate punishment of Davis, on which points Glanville is rather unsatisfactory. According to this source, Taverner, or Tavney, as the name is locally pronounced, felt something get up behind him as he was riding home, and from the eerie feeling that came over him, as well as from the moldy smell of the grave that assailed his nostrils, he perceived that his companion was not of this world. Finally the ghost urged Taverner to bring the case into court, and it came up for trial at Carrickfergus. The counsel for the opposite side browbeat Taverner for inventing such an absurd and malicious story about his neighbor Davis, and ended by tauntingly desiring him to call his witness. The usher of the court, with a skeptical sneer, called upon James Haddock, and at the third repetition of the name a clap of thunder shook the court, a hand was seen on the witness table, and a voice was heard saying, Is this enough? Which very properly convinced the jury. Davis slunk away, and on his homeward road fell from his horse and broke his neck. Between the clergy and the witches a continuous state of warfare existed, the former, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, ever assumed the offensive, and were most diligent in their attempts to eradicate such a damnable heresy from the world. Consequently, human nature being what it is, it is not a matter of surprise to learn that ghosts or the devil occasionally appear as the aggressors, and cause the clergy as much uneasiness of mind and body as they possibly could. In or about the year 1670 an Irish clergyman, the Reverend James Shaw, Presbyterian minister of Khan Money, was much troubled with witches, one of them appearing in his chamber and showing her face behind his cloak hanging on the clock pin, and then stepping to the door, disappeared. He was troubled with cats coming into his chamber and bed, he sickened and died, his wife being dead before him, and, as was supposed, witched. Before his death his man going out to the stable one night, saw as if it had been a great heap of hay rolling towards him, and then appeared in the shape and likeness of a bear. He charged it to appear in human shape, which it did. Then he asked, for what cause it troubled him. It bid him come to such a place and it should tell him, which he engaged to do, yet ere he did it, acquainted his master with it, his master forbade him to keep such a tryst, he obeyed his master. That night, there was a stone cast at him from the roof of the house, but did not hurt him, whereupon he conceived, that had been done to him by the devil, wherefore he resolutely went forth that night to the place appointed, being a rash bold fellow, and the devil appeared in human shape, with his head running down with blood. He asked him again, why he troubles him. The devil replies, that he was the spirit of a murdered man who lay under his bed, and buried in the ground, and who was murdered by such a man living in such a place twenty years ago. The man came home, searched the place, but found nothing of bones or anything like a grave, and shortly after the man died. To which story Mr. Robert Law sagely adds the warning, it's not good to come in communing terms with Satan, there is a snare in the end of it.